which I should have done at the beginning. So without further ado, our first presentation, you all have the floor. Great. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Micah Vandegrift. I'm assuming you can hear me if you can't or if you can say something in the chat. Oh, Lenny's nodding. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and then we'll get started. Glad to be with you all today. I hope everyone is doing well. Let me move this. All right. We should be in presentation mode. Lenny, does it look right? All right. So uh, as uh, Amanda mentioned, we're presenting today on a, a research development program that we were sponsoring at NC State University Libraries um, in the spring that very quickly because of COVID, we had to switch to online. Uh, as Amanda said, my name is Micah Vandergrift. I'm the Open Knowledge Librarian here at NC State. And Lenny, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Lenny Argabray. I just graduated from UNC Chapel Hill. And Lenny was with us in the spring as a, a field experience student. So. Um, and this was kind of her main initiative. So I'll describe a little bit of the background. The Open Incubator Program was a, a concept that we developed um, and piloted in the summer of 2019 uh, as a way to gather our, uh, a small cohort of researchers together uh, and to work with them to take an, uh, a project, whatever the research project might be, whether it was a, a classroom experience or a, a data project um, from proof of concept uh, from an idea to a proof of concept. So not that we're committing to do the entire project with them, uh, but just to uh, instill some um, some open values into them. So a lot of the, the sessions that we would walk them through are things like, what does, uh, what does open infrastructure mean for my project? How do I develop a, a community around the work that I'm doing? As you can see on the screen there, uh, we have a public website at the bottom there. Uh, and also uh, because uh, in the spirit of open, we released uh, all of the materials for the open incubator. So if this uh, sounds exciting or interesting to you, you could go and grab those materials uh, and um, adapt and adopt them to your own needs. I just posted it in the chat. Thanks, Lenny. So the, the based on the first version of the incubator that we ran last summer, we expected, uh, planning to do this this spring, that this is what it would look like. That we would have some uh, in-person sessions. We tried to spread them across campus because we have uh, people from various uh, disciplines and departments. So we would do three at our main library, one at Hunt Library, and then one at Veterinary Medicine. Um, we poll the participants and uh, ask uh, what was you know, generally the best time for people. Uh, it was a, a middle of the afternoon. Um, and then we were starting to think about the logistics of, okay, how, do, how can uh, we have, you know, someone on our veterinary medicine campus, um, how can we make it uh, easy for these people to all get to the space that we all need to be together? Uh, of course, along with that, we were thinking about uh, ways to incentivize them showing up. So can we buy some coffee? Do we have some cookies there? Um, and then thinking about the, the physical space of the room. Uh, uh, what kind of whiteboards do we need? Presentation space, screens, and then of course paper, sticky notes, and those sorts of things. The photographs that you see there are from the spring 2019 version of the incubator. So we, we had a really good concept of what this would look like in a physical environment. And then the coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, so then around mid-March, COVID had begun to affect university decisions. At the time, NC State had just extended its spring break to two weeks. And now we were one week away from March 23rd, which would be our first module of five modules total. We were all also working from home now, our whole team of librarians who would be working on this program. Um, and so this would likely affect our whole program. As much as we'd been planning, we still thought it was fair to ask the cohort if they wanted to cancel this program, which would be completely reasonable, what with all the stressing that was going on. But they were still interested, um, and the scheduling time that they'd set up would still work for them, especially since their schedules were a little bit more flexible. Um, so we had to figure out how to create a suitable environment for the program. We referred to resources that, like you see on the right, for example, um, to give us advice about online teaching and about online activities. And the overall design of the cohort, we wanted to really keep in place. It emphasized discussion and it emphasized interactive tactile activities. Um, 
discussion could certainly happen live. Uh, so we set up a shared collaborative notes document that could help to make that even better, like to solidify engagement and understanding um, as the discussion was happening. The, just, the activities, however, were a little bit trickier uh, because they still had to be interactive. So in my role, I was placing a little bit more of a um, project manager type of role. Um, I met with each of the librarians um, on the team to discuss how to adjust their activities so that, for instance, a sticky notes about individual tools and infrastructures that uh, was an activity that we planned would now be something like a free writing exercise in a document template. So the librarians adjusted their lesson plans and set up these activity spaces within the collaborative notes document. Also, after revising the curriculum, we were thinking about ways to facilitate this online conversation. Um, and we set up roles for the team. It really helped that there were like five of us to play these different roles. It would have been much harder if it was a single person um, doing all of this. So, Already one of the librarians would be leading the discussion for each of the individual modules. Um, there would be another person who would be managing the chat so that if anyone preferred to talk that way, uh, that could be addressed and it wouldn't like distract some the facilitator uh, from having to check the chat. Uh, and then a third person would be keeping live notes running within the collaborative notes document and inviting participants to join in the note taking like they preferred. Um, we also had someone who was noting anything worthwhile for assessment uh, so that we could uh, review later. So having these assigned roles and also documenting our progress as we were going through allowed us to not all have to be present in all of the modules. And also, um, we were careful to lay out rules and expectations for the group. Um, we thought that was really important and we were picking up a lot of that in the tips that we were referring to. So some of these rules, for example, um, were like keeping the video and the microphone on all the time. Um, using the video helped to encourage collaborative discussion from our participants. And it also helped our facilitators from feeling like they were talking into a void, trying to get some sort of discussion going and nobody was like in, in the space, you know. Um, and so deciding on these rules and voicing them from the beginning really helped to make a more conducive environment for trusting and participatory type of learning. So having completed the program series online, but also a separate one in person, we found that there were a couple of differences in how instruction can engage people. Um, these methods do have their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, like, for example, the collaborative notes document really became a central hub for interaction. During activities, as everyone wrote down their thoughts within the same document, um, it would allow everyone to see what each other was writing, and then they could sort of pull what somebody else had had as an idea into their own activity of their brainstorming for how it could apply to them. Um, and it would feel a little bit more permanent to them because it was all there. They could refer to it later. Um, also, our librarian team could review the notes document and add comments or like for suggestions or resources that then we could like refer to them later. Um, and so a couple of examples of benefits to online instruction besides this was like it provided a more permanent and thorough proof of assessment. We could record these sessions. We got permission from our participants, but we could do that. Um, and everyone could see the same thing. Um, like it wasn't affected by the distance of like this piece of paper, this activity, like not everyone can see it or they're in the far part of the room they can't necessarily hear what somebody else is saying everyone was like in front of their computer um but an advantage of an in-person version um like you could more easily do smaller scale partnerships like turn to the person next to you and figure out how you would relate to these open strategies and you could have these tactile engagement opportunities like easily drawing a diagram there are online tools for drawing but like it's a little bit easier sometimes to just draw on paper.
Yeah, so uh, in, in uh, leading toward our conclusion here, and we should, I don't think we mentioned this from the outset, but the, the cohort was relatively small. So uh, the first round we had seven people and this round we did in the spring, it was only four. So it was really um, a nice, um, any bigger than that size would have been a little different to manage, but having a small cohort I think was really helpful for this um, shifting to online. So some of the things that we've learned are that um, that future incubators, uh, especially now as we're all adapting to new announcements daily, um, we're very confident that they can and will be uh, probably de definitely this fall delivered online and that it can also be successful and as successful as the, um, the uh, in-person version that we did uh, last summer. Um, Lenny mentioned this already, but I'll underscore that uh, it became really clear that um, project management or, or like the coordinator role, which is the role that, that Lenny played for us, was incredibly helpful for tying all these ideas together. So in the who worked on the project with us um, were responsible for a particular topic and Lenny was able to be involved in each of those topics and um, kind of uh, make sure that everything was harmonizing. Um, there were just uh, uh, described some great examples of how we thought about the activities and how they would translate to an online environment. Um, so we're again very comfortable with that now. Uh, and then finally we realized that um, the, the value of a, of a program like this is that there is a cohort, that there's a, a sense of people together doing a thing. Uh, ideally, we would all be together in a, in a conference room or in a, uh, one of our uh, incredible spaces at Hunt Library around a table talking and having ideas, but we were still able to create that sense in an online environment. So I just wanted to call out our collaborators on the uh, on the incubator here. Um, Mia Partlow, Tisha Metnich, Emily Cox, and, and Will Cross, who were sort of the uh, part of the coordinating committee of the program as we uh, developed it from November to, to January and February, and then launched and ran it from March on. Lenny, anything that I forgot that you'd like to add? Sounds good. <laughs> We're happy to answer any questions at the end. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll stop sharing now. I believe it's my turn next, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, all right. Make sure I'm sharing the right screen for y'all. Okay, so you should be able to see my slides and I do still have the chat open so that I can see any questions that you'll have. Um, alrighty, so I am Joe Klein, I'm the GIS and Data Visualization Librarian at, oops, am I, no, I'm not muted, um, at UNC Greensboro. Um, you can find me um, on Twitter and LinkedIn um, using my uh, username elk2klein. Or if you have any questions or need to get in contact, you can also email me at ejklein um, at uncg.edu. And I apologize, my mic might be a little bit far away. All right. So, all right. Um, I'm a part of the planning committee for the 2020 Southeast Data Librarian Symposium, which will be taking place virtually this October. Um, a little bit about the Southeast Data Librarian Symposium. Um, it's a conference about data librarianship for librarians, research data specialists, students, and other interested folks that are interested in data. Um, some topics of interest this year include research data management, data analysis, and data vis tools, um, data support for undergraduate research, and data literacy. Last year, the conference was held at Tulane University in New Orleans and was a small and highly social event of just over 50 attendees, um, emphasizing discussions and group activities and kind of hands-on group um, partnerships. Um, sessions included a small poster session, workshops, lightning talks, panels, and a reception and a social hour. When I attended last year's conference, my biggest worry was traveling despite anxiety over hurricanes and flying in general, which I look back on now and it's kind of cute. Um, so this year, other worries um, have prompted us like many to move the symposium to the virtual format. The networking and social aspects of the previous face-to-face -face symposia were important for us to keep during this year's virtual event. Um, and we, were, we felt that we were limited with what we could accomplish in Zoom alone. Um, so we decided to look into a supplementary platform um, that would allow attendees to engage in discussion and conversation outside of scheduled sessions. Um, so something like collaborative note-taking as Lenny 
Minnie and Micah mentioned, um, or more uh, chat-oriented uh, platforms. Uh, a few of us had already used Discord previously, and I was familiar with it through UNC Greensboro's library server, which was set up shortly after most of us began working from home in the spring, and which I have as my background behind me, but with details blurred out. Um, so before I get started as to what Discord is and what features are available, um, while I was reading into the differences between face-to-face -face and virtual conferences in preparation for our planning committee meetings, I stumbled across social presence, which is a topic new to me, but maybe not new to many of you. Uh, so social presence is when people project their personal characteristics into the community, thereby presenting themselves to other participants as real people, um, which is a direct quote from Garrison et al. Um, in 2000. This is especially important for communicating in the virtual um, environment where you have no passive physical embodiment, um, which can be especially tiring if you're not used to establishing social presence through text or voice or video. Um, so this can lead to what I've seen referred to as Zoom burnout, um, which is very exhausting. Uh, one barrier to the formation of social presence by virtual conference attendees um, and therefore to impactful and meaningful communication is that much of the formal and informal socialization that you um, usually get from conferences is conducted during receptions, meals, social hours, and breaks between sessions. Um, and it's not as easily conducted in a virtual setting where there's no common area to regroup in in between sessions or during those periods of time. Um, it's difficult to establish social presence when you can't bond with potential connections over a shared conference experience, um, which happens spontaneously, randomly, um, between sessions, um, or when you can't, you know, turn to the person seated next to you and start a conversation about something. Um, using just Zoom, WebEx, and other virtual meeting and webinar applications, attendees are kind of limited, um, and I'm seeing lots in the chat nodding at all of this, yep. Um, so attendees are limited in how they can interact with each other within the context of uh, conference content. So for example, in this session, some folks socialize via the group chat as they came in, to, um, and you can also ask questions or comment or acknowledge the presenter as Micah just did um, using comments. Um, and there's also a hashtag to tweet about the session. Um, and as Lenny and Micah mentioned, people can participate in collaborative notes through Google Docs during uh, interactive workshop sessions. Oh, sorry, my timer says it's already been nine minutes. It is not. Um, during larger sessions, discussions can be distracting and take over chat boxes, which are usually the presenter's primary avenue for feedback and questions from the audience. Um, so this can be very distracting and, and uh, potentially hide questions. And chat discussions can also move pretty fast, creating a topic lag for people with slower internet connections or folks who aren't as speedy with the keyboard. Um, so I like to type basically paragraphs and comments, and by the time I press enter, the conversation has moved on. Um, after a session ends, attendees can exchange snippets of discussions on Twitter, or you can bravely start an email thread with usually just one other person, maybe two or more if you know you have a, a, a interest in common. Um, additionally, social presence that is established is ephemeral. Um, the workshop ends and participants are dumped from the meeting chat box and you're left alone in your room or your office where um, you're attending the conference when the host ends that session. Um, a tweet gets sent into the void and then you put your phone down and you don't think about it anymore and that conversation doesn't exist until you look at Twitter again. Um, or else my favorite phenomenon, which is the virtual equivalent of dead air, um, which is when you have a live stream on YouTube or Twitch um, and the person presenting has taken a break. So there's just an empty chair and you can hear maybe somebody off camera having a muffled conversation that doesn't involve you um, or, you know, shuffling of things moving around. Um, so the challenge for the Southeast Data Library and Symposium and other virtual conferences is to facilitate persistent social presence throughout the duration of the conference. Um, Discord is a quickly rising tool um, that can help meet that challenge, we, which we were excited to um, set up and use in this context. And my cat is losing her mind behind me, so I apologize if you can hear her scratching at the door. Um, so Discord is an instant messaging or voice over internet protocol application. It's similar to Slack, um, originally used originally developed for use as a social media platform for gamers, so a chat um, discussion service. Um, and it serves in this context for the Southeast Data Library and Symposium 
as a virtual common space where attendees will be able to take a break from the formal scheduled sessions, but still remain on topic or in conference mode. So you don't leave and um, go do other things in your house or you know go to your normal work. You can stay in conference mode and keep your, your mind on that topic if you choose to. Um, attendees can enter this virtual space and participate in spontaneous discussions about conference content or topics, um, or you can also engage in informal social conversation and therefore feel more socially present in conference proceedings and among the group that you're learning with, which is very important for um, more interactive conferences where one of the goals is to learn. Um, Discord offers multiple ways to communicate, um, which is one of the features, the reasons that we wanted to use it. Um, so attendees can engage in both synchronous and asynchronous text discussions um, in which you can use custom reactions to respond to messages. So much like in Zoom, you can use thumbs up symbols, apl uh, applause for um, if someone says something you really like or agree with, and you can use custom ones, um, and Michael uses the applause in the participants list. Um, or you can use custom reactions that are specific to your conference, which is pretty cool too. So I could put the little Southeast Data Librarian logo in there and you can use it if it's like a topical um, uh, chat. There's also the ability to move between multiple simultaneous group discussions and see who's in each discussion before joining, um, which you might see at like a face-to-face -face conference. So it can help supplement that lack um, in the virtual atmosphere. Um, and small group chats and direct messaging is also an option. So um, attendees initiate can initiate smaller group chats between themselves um, or direct messages and video calls if they know someone and want to say hi or if they want to learn more about somebody. Um, and a lot of other features are also available. So attendees can also connect their accounts to Twitter and GitHub um, so that you can share and connect with them on those sites. And you can set a custom status to denote things like pronouns, job title, or time zone. Um, you'll notice that I have my pronouns in my uh, Zoom, I guess, URL display name, um, but that's limited as far as biographical information that I can share using Zoom without putting stuff into the chat. Um, as organizers of the event, um, we have multiple options for organizing what they refer to as the server, so the broad Discord um, environment for your conference. Um, they have a handy template that they made specifically for like digital conventions um, called the Global Communities Template, which is very handy, or you can also start from scratch. Um, I will be using our, our UNCG Libraries support server, which is in the background, as an example um, for our Southeast Data Librarian Symposium server. You can separate multiple topics of interest, so data viz, data analysis, maybe um, online electronic resources and open access um, or open data into individual topics, and then you can make smaller channels within those topics, which are considered discussions. Um, so if you have 10 live discussions in a room, okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, so you have uh, multiple discussions within those um, topics. We'll be using welcome introductions and coffee break channels in addition to our topic discussions. And you can also group attendees by things they have in common using roles, which you can also use to assign moderators, which is very helpful when you have more folks um, and you wanna make sure people um, are following etiquette rules and, and know what's going on. Um, and have someone to turn to when there's a bug or a problem. All right, and another reason we wanted to use Discord is you can push announcements to all of these discussion channels so that um, if the schedule changes or a session is about to start soon, you can, um, I guess, interrupt discussions and say, hey, y'all, session B is starting in five minutes. Here's the Zoom link, or you're free to continue your discussion. Um, there's in-browser desktop and mobile app versions for folks who prefer to use their phones or who don't want to install anything, um, although there are some limitations with the in-browser version. Um, and there's a large user base with a lot of support available through forums, facts, and other uh, FAQs and other resources. And it's free, which is the biggest reason why we used it. Um, so here are a number of limitations to be aware of, which weren't deal breakers for our purposes, but which might frustrate attendees or make them less likely to use it. Um, so these include accessibility issues with screen readers, keyboard navigation, and small, um, hard-to-click buttons. Um, it's also yet another thing to learn, install, and make an account for, which creates extra steps for attendees. Um, and there are bugs and technical issues that can be associated with video calls for folks using that in-browser version. So I've run into that problem with my local, uh, my friend group. We play uh, tabletop games using Discord, um, which is a common use for it. So we have problems with video calls all the time. Um, there are also the limit literal limitations of Discord. Um, for example, you can only have 500 channels on one server, which basically means you can only have 500 simultaneous discussions. 
Um, we don't anticipate running into any of those problems with our 50 person or around 50 person uh, uh, size conference, but larger events like ACRL might potentially run into issues with that. Um, <laughs> only 500, yeah, <laughs> it's, you know, such a small amount. Um, and as with all virtual meeting applications, there will be issues with speaking over people accidentally, background noise, and mic problems, but these are, are common plagues for all virtual conferencing and, and video um, tools I have found. So, so far, what I have learned from a, a forum review, so a review of those support forums, and informal preliminary usability interviews that I've done with some coworkers and other Discord users, um, is that the biggest barriers to using Discord effectively is a lack of familiarity and confidence using the application. So people aren't familiar with it, they're maybe new to the virtual format in the first place, and they have to, you know, now they have to create an account, download this thing, it's too much. Um, so there isn't much published literature on how to get over that barrier and on the use of these types of chat applications in the context of virtual conferences specifically. Um, but for now, um, some strategies that we have brainstormed and come up with to help overcome those barriers um, are as follows. Um, so sharing information about uh, how Discord can be used um, and what features are available to attendees um, this can be done with a etiquette information sheet, which you can share along with your welcome email um, that you blast out before the conference begins. Um, and you can also um, create an automatic prompt to start the conversation when users join channels or join the Discord server. Um, organizers should also consider training specific folks with the moderator role on how Discord works and specific actions they can take to facilitate conversations, um, but show attendees how Discord can be used and get them started through social sessions or other group activities to help get that flowing. Um, also avoid hosting sessions solely in Discord. Um, provide redundancy and information by making announcements through email as well. Um, and for example, you can set up a poster session topic with a voice or a video call channel for each poster presenter in Discord. But for folks that aren't using the Discord server or that can't for accessibility reasons, or they're just not willing to do that for this conference, um, it might be a good idea to also share those posters via GitHub or the conference website and allow attendees to make comments um, or share through collaborative note taking or some other um, format. Um, Another recommended thing to get folks to use it is um, to encourage moderators uh, of scheduled sessions to invite folks to continue the discussion on the Discord at the end of each session with a link to the Discord server and the uh, name of the channel specific to the topic that you're that's being discussed in the um, session. Um, so that there's a channel already, already ready to go and people can just go on over. All right, overall Discord, whoops. <laughs> overall Discord is a flexible and free tool that we expect will help virtual conference organizers facilitate networking through more meaningful and sustained interactions between attendees who can then create stronger connections and better engage with conference content. Thank Joe, you. thank you so much for that. That was, I'll, I'll admit I use Discord for gaming purposes as well. So now we have our final presentation for the day. Marcy, Leah, the floor is yours. Okay, let me share my screen. Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> let me get my notes here. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. As the moderator stated, I'm Marcy Burton, and my role at UNC Greensboro is Electronic Resources Cataloging Technician. My co-presenter today is Leah Leninger, and she is our Health Sciences Reference Librarian. Today we are talking about a LibGuide we created of free higher ed collections in the time of COVID-19. So here are some statistics about our university. The picture at the top right is the university with the skyline of Greensboro in the background. And the picture at the bottom is of our main uh, library, the Walter Clinton Jackson Library. Leah? Hey, Marcy. Okay, just a quick pause here. Um, I'm not seeing the slides on my screen. Uh, can other people see them? Is it just me? I'm sorry. I thought I should. Ah. That's okay. Look, behind me, we've got the lovely Jackson Library background. That can stand in. <laughs> Well, I don't know what happened here. Apparently, I've got off the, am I completely off the Zoom? 
Nope, you're still in. Uh, we can hear you. We can see you. And I uh, can't see my Zoom icon. This is crazy. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, Leah, do you happen to have access to the slides as well? Or I do. How about um, Marcy? Do you mind if I take control? No, and I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologies. I don't know what. It's been fine until, of course, it was my turn, and now all of a sudden, Murphy's Law has come into play. That happens. You know what? It's Murphy's Law of Zoom meetings. This happens. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. I don't even. Okay, so I am going to share my screen. Does everybody see an entry slide that um, has our kind of opening thing on it? Leah, I think I may have figured it out. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. No problem. Maybe. Now, does everybody see March 2020 or is it still on Leah's? How about if you see a title, creating a list of free higher ed collections? Say yes. Okay. I think fate has spoken. I'm going to be driving. <laughs> By all means, go ahead then, Leah. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, so here are more pictures of UNCG, and we just love it. I'm going to skip ahead to my stuff. So um, in, uh, in March, of course, UNCG, uh, along with other universities, went online only. Our libraries already had a lot of online services and resources. It was still a big transition for us. One of the really nice things that happened is that a lot of information providers stepped up to um, provide free sources. Now, the downside of that is that it was a little bit chaotic. I don't know if anybody else had just a ticker tape parade of emails in, in March, but um, the, my coworkers and I were all emailing each other, hey, did you see this nice source, that nice source? Vendors were emailing us directly, the collection development librarians were emailing, and of course, free sources were being advertised in you know, all kinds of other channels. Um, and the thing is, it wasn't all just, here's a free source, click onto this easy link and everybody sees it. Um, there were, you know, a, some arrangements that needed to be made. In some cases, a resource needed to be activated by the institution. In some cases, uh, a user needed to create their own individual account. Um, and of course, some of the resources had expiration statements, others didn't. So it just became really clear that we needed a public list for um, us to use for ourselves and when, when helping our patrons. So um, basically we, we made that. And uh, it was mostly Marcy. She put tons of stuff up here. I don't know. She already mentioned her, her job title, I think, um, that she activates a lot of electronic resources for us. So she did a ton of great work on this. I'm going to go away from the uh, slides here for a minute and we'll see if I can actually show the guide. Should, should we be able just to click on the graphic, the graphic that says LibGuide? It says LibGuide. But before you do that, you, you can see that the link to the LibGuide was prominently displayed on our front, on our main page, our home page. So it was easy to find and um, if needed. Lee, if you can click on the graphic, it just says LibGuide. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, sorry, I'm doing it. Okay. I'm going rogue here. I went to the live guide. <laughs> so you just let me know where you want me to click. I, I can't see it. You can't see it, oh my goodness. Can other people see this? And I will put a link to it, which might be even better. Just the presentation, okay. Well, you know, somebody had to, had to go down and, and in flames on this in terms of tech. Today it was me. Um, well, it wouldn't how, be. How the cookie crumbles sometimes. Let's see. Exactly. Let's see if I can share. Okay, hang on. Let me see if I can share back. I'll take it back from you. There we go. Okay. Is that Leah? I believe Leah, that's you. That's me. So yeah, I, I am now sharing my browser. Yeah. All right, so as you can see, we had various tabs. Our apologies again, guys, sorry. Um, <laughs> had various tabs. We wanted to um, differentiate between e-resources and what was just COVID related. So on the e-resources tab, 
Um, as you can see, we scroll down, Leah put a box that goes to our um, discovery service. And then of course we had links to various organizations and vendors and associations that was giving us free access. Of course, earlier on, this list was just humongous, but as time has dwindled on, vendors and, and um, groups have rescinded that free access, so we have just removed them and kept, and we have tried to keep this LibGuide as, pr as present as possible. So, and as you can see, we also have a free music related resources because we have a large music library and we wanted to um, differentiate those links as well. We can go back up to the top. You can see our COVID resources, which still remain very active and a long list. And these, as I said, are just COVID-19 related resources only. And then we did have a couple of tabs for library help. And um, that was kind of a basic um, site. And then for the librarians tab also were lots of compilations and other resources that Leah felt was pertinent for our library staff. So, Leah? All right, so let me, let me flip back to the uh, slides here. I could do a little song and dance while Leah gets ready, but um, I don't want to do that to you guys. You've suffered enough already. Here we go. All right. Leah's got it now. All right. So just um, a few words about how I use the, the guide as a liaison librarian. Of course, I, I used I, it. Excuse me, Leah. I think you have to click present. Whoa. Okay. Because we're seeing all... All right, how are we doing now? I still see the entire browser. Do you see present beside of the yellow share button? Oh no, I'm presenting the, oh, I'm presenting on that page. Oh Lord. Yeah. So okay. that's fine. I think if you just click present, you'll be ready to go. I did. Do you see, you see the browser yet or the? I'm, I'm still seeing the browser. <laughs> oh, good. good night. We are okay. just. Pretty much going to close everything up. Yeah, <clears throat> Leah, try clicking on share screen at the bottom, the little upward green arrow. You're going to be able to indicate which screen you actually want to share. Yep, I've been doing that, and unfortunately, I think I thought I had indicated the screen that has my. There you go. Address. That looks great. Okay, y'all are super. I apologize. So, um, <laughs> okay, so yeah, I used it in consults. Um, mm -hmm. with any of the patrons who were coming into the library and of course I all um, I used it with um, my own patrons in the uh, research consultations and of course I wanted to keep myself up to date so I gotta say the most common question was do y'all have this textbook so of course I didn't start with our discovery service but um, if we didn't have the the book online um, then typically I hunt and peck around the free guide a little bit and all those different links to see what I could come up with. And the answer in a lot of cases was, hey, use Red Shelf. You have to sign up for your own free account, but then you can get, um, you know, your textbook is available mm -hmm. there. So, um, of course, the COVID-19 research was interesting to my liaison areas, and I was really appreciating the information from the, the Medical Library Association and the information on library practices, what other people were doing. So in terms of how was it received or how did it go, um, it's the third most used LibGuide in our collection. Yay. It, it rates above this even how to cite things, that citation guide, which I think is, is definitely kind of a landmark. Of course, we all know that sometimes people click into a guide and um, then, you know, maybe it, it is useful to them or maybe it isn't. So I thought that I would uh, share a reaction or two that I got from it. So just anecdotally, um, my nurses and my folks in communication sciences and disorders, especially those two groups, they really liked the, the COVID-19 resources. 
um, I, I think that the, the students from other areas who were chatting in through library help, a lot of them really liked it. One of them, I put a quote up here, just kind of wigged out. They were so happy. They loved all the free stuff. Um, now the guide was not quite as useful for community researchers, like a lot of other academic libraries. We have got some great subscriptions that require a UNCG login account. And in order to activate some of the temporarily free collections, we had to put that that UNCG login or authentication on it. So the guest researchers would come in and they would click on maybe one of the UNCG links and they'd get super frustrated. So I soon learned just not to show that page to the members of the community who were chatting in for, for recommendations on places to go. And uh, basically I'd, I'd go back to our usual go-to, which is referring to NC Live. And when people said, oh, I don't have a, a public library card. Um, yes, I'm in North Carolina, but I don't have a card. Um, if I couldn't tell whether their library was issuing cards online or not, I would just point them to the State Library of North Carolina. Um, they were still doing the online card signups, which was um, amazing. So, so what how we, yeah. So how did we keep up with all this? Leah had mentioned the spreadsheet earlier so we just kept updating the spreadsheet, um, adding when we needed to, and we didn't want to just delete as access ended. So I decided to go through and just strike through so that for future reference, we knew what vendors had been gracious enough to um, share free access with us and which ones did not apparently. And um, so, and for, stati for statistical purposes also, we didn't want to delete. So um, as you can see on the screen, the spreadsheet um, with, a, with an expiration date, we try to keep up with that, or if it was an extension. And we also have been hearing of, of some new um, resources that have been made available. So we're also adding, even at this time. So, Leah? So um, that's just a quick look at the, the uh, temporarily free collections guide that, that we put up and, and how we used it. And uh, we are, we appreciate your time and we're open to questions as are the other panelists, I'm sure. So perfect. What we're going to do with questions is if you feel comfortable unmuting yourself, you can unmute yourself. Um, give your name, who you're asking the question to, and ask your question. But if you also want to put them in chat, I will be more than happy to read it out loud for you. So I am going to mute myself again and scroll through chat and make sure I didn't miss a question somewhere. While we're waiting, I would like to say again, thanks guys for your patience and the issues, technical issues that we had. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've had the same exact problem with um, sharing screens in Zoom and the presentation opening up in a new tab, but the share screen doesn't update the view. I've had that oh. same bug. <laughs> And let's face it, Zoom is a fickle, fickle beast, and sometimes it does not do what you want it to do at all. Yeah, Marcy, you did a great job. Thank you. And thank you to Leah, too. She had to take over the reins, and I know that was that's not something she'd had to do in the past, so I, I appreciate your patience, too, Leah. Definitely, Leah, you did, too. I was just expecting Marcy to do a little uh, karaoke there. Well, if we were desperate enough, I would have, but I didn't feel we were at that stage yet. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there is actually a question in the chat. Actually, I've got two questions in the chat. So the first one is going to be for Marcy and Leah. It's the, can you talk a bit more about how you kept the vendor sheet so up to date? Um, it was lots of um, just, you know, emails and when emails came in, um, just checking to make sure that the data was updated on the spreadsheet and also just a lot of actually just clicking the URLs and going to the website to see 
oh, well, look, there's a note saying the um, access has been extended or just you no longer have access. Just, you know, they've cut it off. So some vendors, as we know, are better than and others in, with communicating updates and deletes and whatnot. So it was just the, just keeping a check with the links. And of course, also some vendors would send emails to let us know about extensions or our, the time was about up, that sort of thing. And Marcy was great with that, I gotta say, all of that. I was about to say, that sounds like a whole lot of work. Our e-resources librarian did something similar. So I have another question and this one is for you, Joe. So this is from Deborah who is at, Deborah, you're at Gaston County, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, it is, I have never used Discord before and she's super interested. Where can you find tutorials for a beginner? I'm glad you asked. And I will admit, I just Googled this. Um, I had a resource saved, but could not find it in my bookmarks quick enough. Um, so one of the biggest sources I just put in the chat is Discord's own uh, support, is their own um, tutorial. So they have a number of resources um, and I'm gonna share my screen real quick if that's okay, just to show off that site in case you don't wanna click on it. Um, so they've got a beginner's guide, which I've found to be very helpful um, in terms of folks who are new to online chat communication in the first place and especially Discord, which can be a little bit more confusing. Um, and they also have a handy server setup page um, for if you are setting up your own server for the conference and you want some help and, you know, channel categories 101 and other features. Um, so I really like using that source. And a follow-up question came in is, did you look at any chat platforms other than Discord before you decided to go with them? Yeah, so we didn't look at any for the Southeast Data Librarian Conference specifically because a lot of us had used Discord already, um, and that's what I was most familiar with. Um, but once we, um, once I was looking into it um, before I actually created our test one, there was another alternative called Remo, I believe, Remo.co, uh, Remo.co, um, which is a, you have to pay for it, it's not free, um, and it's more like a virtual, um, uh, environment so like it shows little pictures of your your icon around tables virtually um, so it's very similar to discord except you have to pay for it and it's it's typically it's like a uh, monthly subscription so it's for more um, like office purposes um, and we really wanted something for free um, I also we looked at slack um, a little bit but one of the uh, personal uh, uh, limitations that I find that I don't like Slack for is you have to pay to see older messages and we wanted to be able to see all messages in the chat no matter when you join um, the discussion um, instead of having to pay to see things that are you know 50 messages back um, especially for longer discussions um, and there are a couple other limitations with Slack um, for the individual channels that you have um, all of the discussions that you would have are, or for the topics, sorry, not channels, for the topics in Slack, all of the discussions are in the same kind of window. You can't, um, you can open them up, but it's really hard to separate out those threads and different, have different discussions at the same time. Whereas in Discord, you can have multiple different discussions um, and it's easy to navigate between them. It's a little bit more organized. You all, thank you all so much for the great discussions. And I'm sorry, I'm not Kim Luby who has foster kittens, but my dachshund has decided that he wants to come chill out in my lap while I do closure. So we are about to go into our lunch break for the next hour. And that is going to last until one o'clock. And then there are going to be more sessions after one o'clock. And let me see if I can bring up my list super fast. I know Linus. I know. So in room A, which is our other room, after lunch, there's going to be the power of words using children's literature to initiate discussions on race relations, racism, and injustices. And that's Alan from East Carolina University. And then in room B, which is where we are right now, it's going to be the quest for visual literacy, what's in an image with, there is a very long list of folks that are going to be a part of that one. So that is definitely a comeback and listen to a lot of fantastic people talk. So you all, thank you so much. So remember, the presentations will be online afterwards. Um, this has been recorded. Go enjoy some lunch and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. You all take care. Thank you. Thank you.